Hey guys, Jack here with you and today I've put together three cases of family tragedies for you. Which case gives you goosebumps? Let me know in the comments. Parents can be very intrusive, arrogant, and demanding in their demands. Sometimes it brings some benefit and sometimes it does not. There are times when this demanding is even dangerous. Brett Ryan was in just such a situation. He grew up in a prosperous and large Canadian family where his parents, Bill and Susan, had four sons. It might seem that having so many children, and especially boys, is hard and exhausting parenting labor. But it wasn't for everyone. Their parents tried to teach the younger Ryans by example. Their father, in addition to his prestigious job at the Toronto Star Daily Newspaper, had many hobbies, such as sports, yoga, and psychology. And as for Susan, she was very hardworking, and the whole family home rested on her shoulders. She not only gave her time to her husband and children, but also kept a huge house in a prestigious area of Toronto in perfect condition, and all this, without the help of gardeners and craftsmen, neighbors passing by the family home, for a while lingered to admire the huge and blooming garden through the fence. It could not be said that Brett was the family favorite. No, Suzanne loved everyone equally, but from the outside, it might have seemed that it was Brett who was scolded least of all for obedience. The thing was, he could always get out of any situation. Even when all the evidence pointed to his involvement, he found a way to prove that he was only partially involved. And amazingly, that ability helped him have a lot of friends. Yeah, Brett was pretty damn popular at school. Everyone wanted to be friends with him, or at least be able to say hello by the hand. Just like his older brothers, Brett went to university after high school. Brett always wanted to be better than his brothers, so he took out an ad in the local newspaper offering Toronto residents a service to paint houses and fences. At first things were going really well. The young man had his first money. Susan was even proud of her son and always held him up as an example to others. But it's one thing when this money is a part-time job and quite another when you drop out of university to spend all your free time breathing in the smell of paint and not having any education. Yes, after a while, Brett dropped out of university. While for the first couple of years, Brett felt confident in front of his older brothers after a while, when Christopher and Leland graduated and found jobs in their specialties, Brett's authority began to fade. Christopher worked for the City of Toronto Transit Commission, and Leland became the family artist and designer. After their studies, they moved out of their parents' home, and Brett, to avoid spending part of his earnings on rent, stayed with his father, mother, and younger brother, who attended a school for gifted children. With each passing year, Brett became more and more desperate. Because of his debts and inability to pay them off, he developed depression. By 2007, when Brett was already 26 years old, his debt had passed $60,000. Brett was considered a pretty smart guy, but he didn't know how to use his mind. At the same time, he did not show how bad he was. He always smiled, helped everyone, was a participant of volunteer movements. No one could believe how big the black hole in his soul was. Finally came that fateful moment when nothing could be done, at least not legally. On October 28, 2007, Brett had no orders for house painting or any other work around the house. Orders are always extremely scarce in the fall. Everyone who wanted to had already painted their houses in the spring or summer. Winter was approaching, from which you should not expect any big earnings. There was no time to wait for anything. Brett put on all the old clothes he had in his closet. A hat, a long sweater he'd gotten from his older brother, a scarf his mother had knitted. The scarf was comically long. Brett hadn't even worn it before, but finally the scarf came in handy. He wrapped it around his face, leaving only a narrow slit for his eyes, and headed for the bank that was on the outskirts of his neighborhood. He was clutching some thick folder and limped playfully on his right foot. Brett waited his turn at the bank, and when he was finally summoned by an employee, he went up to her and told her in a quiet voice that he had a gun with him. He also told her to take all the money out of the bank's cash register and give it to him. Otherwise, he would shoot here, and the first person he would kill would be her. 
The girl with trembling hands handed him all the cash she had in the cash register, and Brett quietly walked out of the building so as not to attract the attention of the guards. And when he was on the street, he ran away. He counted the money he had stolen. It wasn't very much, a little over a thousand dollars. To pay off his debts, he would have to rob about 60 banks. Sounds fantastic, but there was no other way out. For the first few days, the novice robber feared that the police would somehow still be able to get to him, so he did not appear at home. He told his mother that he had an order in a neighboring town, and he himself spent the night in the car. Periodically, Brett crept up to his house to see if there was a police car in the bushes. No, it was quiet. No one was looking for him. That's good. So he's headed in the right direction. The first robbery was followed by a second, third, fourth. Brett changed clothes each time. He didn't wear his old clothes anymore. He bought them secondhand or even found them in the trash. After the crime, he burned the used clothes. Brett also purchased a beard from a store that sold outfits for costume parties. The bank employees he threatened always noticed his beard and later testified that the attacker was a bearded man. Toronto newspapers began publishing a number of articles about the bearded robber. But the bearded robber never made a fortune in robberies. The maximum amount that could be stolen did not exceed $3,000. Finally, Brett had a misfire. The police spotted his car on the surveillance cameras and followed him all the way home. By that time, they still had no direct evidence of his guilt. It was decided to just follow the suspect. It was as if Brett sensed the outside surveillance and did not go on a robbery spree for the next 15 days. Although before that, the intervals between crimes were three or four days. The cops thought they were on the wrong trail and wasting their time suspecting an innocent guy. But finally, luck smiled on them. Brett left the house, got into a car, and later got out of the car not far from the bank, wearing a different, strange outfit. He went into the branch, stayed there for a while, but at the exit, he was met by the police to finally handcuff him and announced that the much-discussed bearded robber had finally been caught. Brett was under investigation for seven months. He was charged with robbery with a firearm. Interestingly, despite having a gun permit, the bearded robber always came to the bank empty-handed. He didn't even have a kitchen knife with him. In total, he was charged with 19 counts and was sent to prison. From there, Brett, just like his family, filed multiple appeals. This yielded results. Only eight of the 19 counts were upheld. But Brett didn't stop there. As soon as he had the opportunity to apply for parole, he took it. In his petition, Brett asked to take into account the fact that he went to these crimes being in a severe depression, caused by two failed relationships, as well as a large amount of debt. At the same time, he once again noted that he went to the crimes without weapons, absolutely not planning to harm anyone. His remarks were accepted, but in order to get out of prison early, he had to undergo a session with a psychologist. The sessions had a positive effect on Brett. All the time he was behind bars, he did not communicate with his family, and now he himself has made a step towards getting closer and restoring relations with his family. The positive changes were noticed by the commissioners, so on November 24, 2010, Brett was released. This freedom, for which the young man fought so zealously, turned out to be very bitter and even harder than it was before. Who was Brett before? A painter with a heavy burden on his soul. What was he now? Brett the bank robber, Brett the ex-con. With such a tainted background, he was never hired by any company. And those who hired him for house painting services, as soon as they recognized him as the bearded robber, refused his services. Also, the neighbors, yes, the same ones who used to praise Susan's garden and visit, now began to spread various unpleasant rumors. The whole Ryan family hastily sold the house and moved to Scarborough. Susan started growing her new garden again, and Brett did get a job with a trading company, but his pay was not high. His parents were also helping him with money to rebuild his university education. Brett still visited a psychologist, and each time the specialist advised him the same thing, don't break the connection with your family. The psychologist's advice really worked. Despite this, Brett's financial well-being left much to be desired. In September 2011, the first happy accident in his life happened. He met Kristen Baxter. Kristen was just a fantastic girl. She had her own apartment, the windows of which overlooked the sea thanks to which the young couple opened a beautiful landscape. 
she was engaged in sports, which allowed her to keep her body in shape. And most importantly, she did not care about Brett's past. They also traveled periodically as a couple and had even been to Australia. Brett's father and mother, watching his relationship with the girl develop, were very happy. In addition, they were sure that their son will finally take his head and Kristen will push him in every possible way to develop and finally take his place in society. Brett felt that life was starting to get better, but there was an unfortunate event that was out of his control and that disrupted the building of a new phase. Brett's father died. For him, it was a real shock. His depressive state began to return, because of which Brett began to visit a psychologist more often. He also had to spend a lot of time with his mother and help her with money, which he already had a little. A long relationship with Kristen had to be developed. Young people were not teenagers, which is enough just to meet and spend free time together. Being madly in love with this enchanting blonde, Brett decided to take a serious step. He had some savings, plus he talked to his mother and said that he wanted to build a family with Kristen. And to do this, he needed to make her an offer that Kristen could not refuse him and remember this day for the rest of her life. Susan realized what her son was getting at and gave him money to buy a ring. It should be noted that the couple had discussed their future before that. And no, Kristen didn't need some expensive gift or something like that. It was enough for her to get a proposal from Brett as a confirmation of his serious intentions. But he still decided to splurge and bought a gold ring with a huge diamond for his beloved. Kristen, of course, told him, yes. Then, as is usually the case, the young people began planning their wedding. Brett agreed with all of Kristen's decisions and nodded approvingly, but he was horrified at how expensive it was and how much he needed to think about his job. He found an engineering job opening for a large technology company on the internet, put together a resume, and responded to it. He even had a successful interview and was accepted. Brett was happy at the time. He immediately excited his fiance and his mother with this news, from whom he again asked for money to buy himself an expensive suit to wear to work. Once again, his mother did not refuse her son. When the suit was already bought, Brett received a call from the company saying that they had to refuse him because the security service had found out about his criminal past. For Brett, it was like thunder that broke over him. His mood began to plummet immediately, and he finally gave up. Why waste time on this endless series of interviews, waiting for answers, if in the end, no one wants to hire a criminal, even if corrected? And most importantly, why waste time studying? Brett decided that it would be better to spend the money his mother and older brothers gave him for his university studies on his wedding to Kristen. And so he did. Brett was back in the situation he had recently gotten out of. He didn't tell his family that he had dropped out of university. And most importantly, he didn't tell his counselor. He also didn't tell anyone that he had been turned down for an engineering job. He put on a shirt, tie, suit and went to paint houses, changing into a change of clothes right on the way, and told his relatives that he was working in an office. In addition, in his social networks, Brett constantly posted various photos from the office, or from some business event, of course, previously downloaded from the internet. And also being near his loved ones, he often pretended as if his phone was ringing and he urgently needed to solve some work issues. He was very skillful at making dust in his eyes, and no one would have thought that Brett was actually a common painter. In September 2016, after a five-year relationship with Kristen, Brett planned to have a wedding. He even agreed to rent an expensive restaurant where it was necessary to pay $100 for each guest. The whole Ryan family was very happy because Brett finally took himself in hand, has a prestigious job, lives in a fancy apartment, and he has a stunning bride but they had no idea that Brett's lies had gone too far and there was no way to get out of it unscathed. By then, the wedding was only a month away and the event required an investment. Our hero again and again borrowed money from his mother, and when he realized that she was no longer able to help him, he literally demanded that she change her job to a better paying one. Also, he planned a bachelor party in August, to which he invited all his friends and brothers. As the fuse of this bombshell began to burn out, Brett still decided to tell his counselor about everything. Brett had been lying to his family for a year about working for a technology company as an engineer. The psychologist was saddened that the guy he'd been leading for so long 
had gotten off the right track again and said that Brett just needed to come clean to his mother. Brett thought about it for a long time, procrastinated, but eventually did so. His mother was insanely upset because she had spent so long telling everyone what a wonderful son she had. She also demanded that Brett tell Kristen everything because if he kept quiet, she would. She also warned her son that his brothers were already aware of the situation and they were on her side. Brett couldn't do that. After all, he'd had such a hard time telling his mother the truth and he couldn't tell Kristen about his lies. Yes, he knew that there was less than a month until the wedding, which wouldn't happen because of his lying. And indeed, it would have been better for Kristen to know everything in advance. But he still kept quiet. It wasn't clear what Brett was counting on. And he also couldn't help thinking that his mother would really tell his fiancée everything. And then, the scandal would be unavoidable. Brett flinched every time Kristen's phone rang, and even stopped breathing until he realized that it wasn't his mother calling, but another friend of his future wife, asking her about her wedding plans and giving her advice. Finally, he figured out how to silence his mother permanently. When Brett was convicted of robbery, he was forbidden to use firearms, so the boy decided that the best way to carry out his plan was to use a crossbow. And besides, it's a pretty silent murder weapon. One of his late father's hobbies was crossbow shooting in the garden at Targets. He taught Brett how to shoot too. Yes, he was good at target shooting, except that it was unlikely his late father thought his son would use that skill in such a way. Brett bought the crossbow and arrows at a sporting goods store and hid it behind the construction debris that lay in Susan's garage. At home, he arranged what he thought was an ingenious alibi invention. He tied a spoon to a fan and set the fan itself on a timer. When the timer went off, the fan turned on, and the spoon moved across the computer keyboard, sending pre-prepared comments to YouTube. From the outside, it must have looked like Brett had spent all day at home, watching videos and commenting on them. On the morning of August 25th, Brett dressed up in strange clothes that hid his face, left the house through the back door to avoid the security cameras, and took a train to his parents' house to get rid of anyone who might disrupt his and Kristen's well-being once and for all. Susan was very surprised at her son's unexpected arrival. She had not been feeling well that day, but Brett, despite his mother's condition, once again began to persuade her and even demand not to tell his future wife anything. The mother categorically refused him. Then he began to get angry, and Susan, sensing something wrong, seeing her son's mad eyes, warned him that she had already called Christopher and he was on his way to them. Brett was going crazy. He ran to the garage, got a crossbow, but his anger and adrenaline overflowed him with such force that he couldn't even make a shot. He just bludgeoned his mother with the butt of the gun and finally, to be sure that she was finally dead, he tightened the rope around her neck. After throwing plastic bags over the body, Brett loaded the crossbow with arrows and hid in the bushes waiting for his brother to arrive. After a while, Christopher arrived, started calling for his mother or his brother, but in response was shot in the neck from behind, which caused him to die within a few minutes. The next victim was the youngest brother, Alexander. As it turns out, Susan managed to call him too. He was also shot in the neck, but either the arrow did not go deep or did not hit vital arteries, so Alexander did not die immediately, but began to scream and call for help. All this time, Leland was in the house, sleeping in his room on the second floor, and had no idea of the carnage that was going on in the garage and in the garden, and most importantly that it was his own brother who was committing the crime. His sleep was disturbed by a scream, and coming downstairs, Leland saw Brett trying to strangle Alexander. A fight broke out between Leland and Brett, and as soon as Leland got the upper hand and managed to push his brother aside, he immediately ran to the neighbors and called the police. Brett stayed in the house. He had nowhere to run. He realized that this was the moment he had completely screwed up his life. There was nothing to do. He took out his phone and wrote Kristen a letter asking her to forgive him. The police arrived at the crime scene and saw a bloody Brett, who was sitting next to his equally bloody but still alive brother Alexander, who would die later, in the hospital. Brett himself asked the policeman to handcuff him and take him to the station, where he would confess to everything. He also said that his mother's body was hidden under packages in the garage, but it was impossible to help her, 
At the police station, and later at the trial, Brett admitted that he did not want to kill Susan. His plan was only to scare her. Christopher and Alexander, on the other hand, he did plan to kill that day. But as witnesses, and if they hadn't arrived, they would still be alive. Just like almost ten years ago, he tried to justify everything with his depressive state, but it did not soften his sentence. And despite the fact that the judge took into account the fact that Brett confessed to everything himself and did not cause the investigation any trouble, the young man received three life sentences, one for each murder, with the right to get parole in 2041. As for Leland, he's not speaking to reporters, but he's known throughout Toronto as the sole survivor of that carnage. After horrific events disrupted the quiet and unhurried lives of the residents of the tiny town of Maymay in the southern Philippines, Lavella Magad finally received permission from law enforcement to clean her own home, which had been the scene of a terrible crime. As she wiped down the surfaces, she reflected on the fact that not long ago, these rooms were filled with prosperity, stability, laughter, and warmth. And then, Someone ruthless had cruelly and inhumanely taken the lives of her two children, after which the shadow of tragedy had consumed all familiar life. It wasn't easy for Lavelle to touch the pieces of furniture that still held the memories of her children, but cleaning distracted her from the heavy emotions, creating a temporary sense of control at least over the order of the house, and she found in this control a temporary refuge from the emotional pain because she also has an adopted daughter. Janice, who miraculously managed to survive the terrible massacre and for whom she must remain strong. In recent days, the grieving mother could only cry, scream, curl up in a ball, and for long hours went deep into herself, although she realized how hard it must be for Janice, who was the only witness to the crime. Reaching her foster daughter's room, Lavella concentrated especially on cleaning. Suddenly, she found an ID card that definitely shouldn't have been in the girl's room. The ID belonged to a 17-year-old boy named Merlin. Lavella immediately went to the police station to report the find. The ID probably belongs to one of the three burglars that Janice had previously reported, she said. The police officers listened carefully to the woman, and the ID did indeed go a long way toward bringing the crime closer to being solved. However, they were not at all surprised, as by this point they were pretty sure who, how, and why killed Gwen and Louis Magood on December 10th, 2021. On September 22nd, 2013, long before the events at the Magods' home, a nine-year-old girl, unable to bear the lack of parental love, care, poverty, beatings, and physical hunger, stood on the dock and stared hopelessly into the water. A lonely, quiet child caught the attention of a woman passing by. When asked what she was doing here alone and if she needed help, the girl looked up and quietly replied, My name is Janice Sabil. I have no parents, and for some reason I don't remember anything. The woman decided that the child had suffered some kind of shock that caused her memory loss. Perhaps something terrible had happened to her. The woman took the girl to the nearest police station, where she was assured that the child would be taken care of. Janice was placed in temporary custody, and they tried to find her parents. Time passed. The search yielded nothing. The girl did not remember anything about her life. No one ever reported the child missing, and after a while the girl was officially recognized as an orphan, transferred to the permanent care of the Department of Social Welfare and Development, which in general did not sadden the child at all. For the first time, she had plenty of food, clothes, and a lot of friendly attention from adults. As it turned out, Janice did not lose her memory, but the defense mechanisms of the child's consciousness, having experienced so many traumatic events, pushed away the memories of family and home. Being an orphan meant staying in a new and better life. That's what she did. Even then, Janice had her first, not yet fully realized, experience of how to behave so that others would want to help you. Unfortunately, the events of 2013 were not a one-time ticket to a new life, but a mechanism for getting what she wanted, 
Cruz and Lavelle Magood were known to others as a well-meaning married couple. Cruz worked as a teacher at the local high school while his wife ran an elementary school. The couple raised two wonderful children. Incredibly intelligent, 18-year-old beauty Gwen participated in all extracurricular activities and was a member of the Girl Scouts. The girl dreamed of a career as a doctor and even, wanting to test herself, enrolled in her last year of high school in a preparatory medical school. 16-year-old Louis became the soul of any company in which he came. He easily made friends, was open, played guitar, sang, and painted. At all this young man showed extreme responsibility, liked to help everyone and planned to achieve success in law. Parents were proud of their children, helped them in everything and supported their plans and desires. The family led a measured life, attended church and did charity work. At one of the charity events in the church, Gwen and met Janice, where she came as a nanny to look after the children. The girls became instant friends and became best friends overnight. Almost the same age, they were fun and funky. They often posted dance videos on TikTok and came up with interesting ways to spend their time. Luis enjoyed participating in their activities. It didn't take long for all three of them to become best friends. At one point, her brother and sister wondered why Janice was working instead of attending school, and Janice told them that she was an orphan. Her parents died of illness when she was very young, so she has had to rely solely on government assistance since she was a child. In order to be able to buy something for herself, she has to work part-time instead of studying. The girl complained that the couple who gave her a job pays very little, and the money received is enough only for food, and she has to work almost around the clock. Later, Janice repeatedly shared her fears about the future with her new friends. Since she is about to turn 18, she is about to lose some social benefits, intended only for minors, and perhaps she will not even have anything to pay for housing. Education and a good career are all but forgotten. Kind-hearted Gwen, heartened by her friend's plight, decided to lend her a helping hand and went to her parents. She told them about the difficult tragic life of a new acquaintance and asked them to adopt Janice so that she had a roof over her head and conditions for studying. She assured the parents that everyone would benefit. Janice would be able to get an education, help share the housework, and help Louis with his homework. The Magads were skeptical at first. They worked as teachers, their income was low, they could hardly afford another child, and besides, there was no extra room in their house for Janice. Louis even volunteered to sleep on the living room couch and gave up his room. The parents couldn't stand their daughter and son's repeated requests and agreed. In July 2021, the Magads officially adopted Janice. They enrolled her in school, and she even took their last name, Janice turned out to be a smart and very polite girl. She accepted all the rules in the house. Cruz and Lavella wanted their children to grow up to be responsible and disciplined people who would know the value of work and money, and so they introduced them to the household. Janice was given exactly the same amount of housework as her sister and brother. The girl gladly performed her share of the duties and always showed respect for her foster parents. To show her gratitude to the family, she would sometimes get up early and cook breakfast for everyone. The couple realized that they had not just helped the girl, as Gwen had asked them to do, but had indeed unexpectedly gained a second daughter, albeit a very old one. At one point, Janice even called them mom and dad. On December 10, 2021, at 2.58 in the afternoon, Cruz, who was checking his middle school homework, received a phone call from a neighbor who hurriedly told him, Go home soon, but don't panic before time. Janice left a strange post on Facebook. Your house appears to have been burglarized. Cruz immediately put work on hold, called his wife, who was also at work at that moment, and rushed home. On the way, he tried to call his children, but they didn't answer. The worried father drove home at top speed, more worried about the safety of his children than the money in the house. At about 3.15 in the afternoon, Cruz pulled up to the house. The door to the house appeared to be locked, so he went to the back door, walked around the house, and entered through a second entrance. Everywhere was a mess. Cruz went from room to room and called the kids by name. When he reached the living room, he saw something no parent should ever see. Luis and Gwen were lying on the floor covered in blood. Luis lay in the living room with his hands tied behind his back, a towel stuffed in his mouth and scars all over his body. He found his eldest daughter, Gwen, 
not far from the bedroom door, her entire body covered in cuts and blood. They were most definitely dead. With a noise in his head on absorbent cotton legs, Cruz suddenly realized that there had to be a third person in the house. He started screaming as hard as he could, Janice, Janice. At one point, Cruz heard a quiet voice say, Daddy. Turning around, Cruz was relieved to see that Janice was alive, hugged her, and noticed that her hair was wet. He asked why it was wet, and the girl replied that she had just gotten out of the shower, and therefore, because of the water, did not hear his call. Of course, her grief-stricken father thought her answer was strange, but he decided that Janice wanted to wash away the horror she had experienced. After all, many people in shocking situations begin to behave strangely. After making sure she was unharmed, the man called the police. Police arriving on the scene found a hammer, a baseball bat, a knife, and a broken wine bottle near the victims. Under normal circumstances, having more than one means of committing a crime means there is more than one perpetrator. The police turned all of these items over to the appropriate officers, hoping to find fingerprints on them, and proceeded to search the house and collect evidence near and around it. They also advised Cruz and Lavelle to carefully examine the items to see what was missing. Very carefully, the officers conducted a detailed interview with Janice, the only survivor. She told them that she and Gwen were in the room, and Louis was in the living room when they heard screaming and the sounds of a fight. She and Gwen immediately went to check what had happened and saw two masked robbers hitting Luis with a hammer and a baseball bat and a third man with a knife. Terrified at what they saw, they gave themselves away with a muffled shriek. One of the thugs chased after Gwen. According to Janice, he didn't notice her. She took advantage of the moment, ran into the small bedroom, locked the door, and hid under the bed. There she lay in shock, not daring to move. When she came to her senses, she sent a text message asking for help to her mother, Lavelle, but her mother did not answer. She was afraid to call the police to avoid giving herself away by ringing or the sound of her voice, so 12 minutes after texting her mom, she wrote two messages for help on her Facebook page. Help. There are strangers in my house. I can only hide in my room right now. I don't want to die. One of those messages was seen by a neighbor, who called Cruz. Three days after the terrible event which struck all residents of the town with its unbearable cruelty, the Philippine police created a special investigative team, including the best staff and specialists. On December 15th, the investigation team said that a large amount of evidence and clues have been collected, and the nature of the case is temporarily classified as robbery and murder. But they do not rule out other versions and will conduct an in-depth investigation. By other theories, the investigation team members meant their growing belief that Janice was the key figure in the crime. Specialists compared evidence from the crime scene and witness statements with Janice's and found several very large discrepancies that allowed them to list the girl as a suspect rather than a witness. First, nothing was missing from the house, which seemed illogical if the three bandits were planning a robbery. Cruz and Lavella said that all the valuables and money were in place, despite the fact that the house was turned upside down. Only Gwen's cell phone was missing. Second, the investigation team found a plastic bag containing bloody pants and shirt in a creek near Cruz's home. It was confirmed that the blood stains on the clothes belonged to the murdered men. It appeared that the perpetrator, or one of the perpetrators, changed into clean clothes after the murder and then fled. That is, he was unusually calm after committing the crime, indicating premeditation and planning. In a robbery that went wrong and ended in multiple murders, the perpetrator would likely have panicked and tried to get away as quickly as possible rather than waste time searching for clean clothes and changing clothes, especially since the parents of the murdered men did not confirm that any articles of clothing were missing. And it is highly unlikely that the perpetrator would have thrown the bloody clothes into the stream behind the house. Moreover, there were signs at the scene that indicated an emotional crime, not a cold-blooded one. There were too many wounds and fractures found on the bodies of the brother and sister, Gwen even had one ear torn off. Most of the injuries were to her face. The autopsy took two full days. Such a scene seems more like anger venting for revenge or jealousy, rather than calculation. The perpetrator was clearly very angry. The nature of the crime clearly indicated a personal grudge killing. 
Third, according to the forensic medical report, the older sister died before the younger brother, which contradicted Janice's testimony, because according to her, the younger brother was attacked first, and with as many wounds as Janice described, it was unlikely that he could have outlived his sister, who had been bleeding for quite some time. Fourthly, the murder weapons were the property of the family. The perpetrators did not bring them with them. The hammer belonged to the head of the family, and he kept it in the laundry room drawer. Cruz was sure that only his eldest daughters Gwen and Janice knew where the hammer was kept. A baseball bat found at the scene, according to the parents' testimony, belonged to their youngest son, who kept it on the second tier of the bed, under a blanket. Burglars who are suddenly caught in the act don't run around the house looking for a hammer and bat, stored in non-obvious places. They either bring their own murder weapons or use available items. It turns out, the location of the two key tools of this crime were known only to the people living in the house. Cruz and Lavelle had alibis. That leaves Janice, who knew where the hammer and baseball bat were kept. Louis gave her his room, so she was aware of the strange location of the item. So even if she wasn't the killer, she was probably an accomplice, since the perpetrator wasn't alone. Fifth, when Lavella received a text message from Janice asking for help, she immediately called back, but Janice did not answer and later said that after not receiving a response from her mother, she published a Facebook post. Dispatch data confirmed Lavelle's call. The Facebook post, quite long and with emoticons, somehow did not fit with the behavior of a person afraid to even move. Sixth, shock and panic could not explain taking a shower instead of calling the police. A person is usually most vulnerable in the shower, plus the water muffles the sounds of approaching footsteps. So why did Janice shower and wash her hair while she claimed she was afraid of the three unknown men, since they might not have left? If Janice had no doubt that the burglars were already gone and wasn't afraid to give herself away by making noises, then why didn't she call the police before taking a shower? Well, and most importantly, the autopsy revealed that Gwen and Lewis passed away around 2 p.m., which meant Janice waited about 48 minutes to start texting her foster mom and waited an hour to post on Facebook. The room she hid in was ransacked. It seemed the perpetrators had scrutinized every corner of the small room, but hadn't noticed Janice. How could that be? By the time Lavelle entered the police station with Merlin's ID, the investigation team had already received the lab report. Janice's fingerprints had been found on the hammer and baseball bat used as the murder weapons. Of course, the implements could have had the prints of the people living in the house, but given the other inconsistencies, she was the prime suspect. Janice was brought to the station for formal questioning on December 18th. She was told about the ID she had found, the results of the forensic examination and all the inconsistencies. Unexpectedly for the detectives, Janice immediately confessed to the crime. She revealed that she and Merlin had killed Gwen and Luis. Shortly after the confession, Janice and Merlin were arrested. Gwen's cell phone, the only missing item from the crime scene, was found in the young man's belongings. Both young men were charged with first-degree murder and sent to juvenile detention without bail. It is still unknown how Janice and Merlin met and what their relationship was. It is only known that Merlin was the same age as the girl and worked in the church, preparing everything necessary for church services. The young people were friends on Facebook. Having studied their correspondence, investigators learned that they planned to kill Gwen and Luis since December 1st. That is, ten days before the tragedy. Cruz and Lavella were distraught and could hardly believe what was happening. Janice had always seemed so quiet and well-mannered. They kindly took her in and treated her like their own daughter. And their children loved the girl like a sister. Why? Why did she do such a thing? Why? Janice attributed it to envy of Gwen. A well-to-do family, loving parents. She resented why she never got what Gwen got effortlessly. In her opinion, the adoption was nothing more than cheap sympathy and a way for family members to validate themselves at the expense of her difficult life. I felt like a stray dog that had been picked up. If the Magads had known how Janice really felt, they would have tried to help her understand, but they didn't. Janice skillfully hid everything behind niceness, and she didn't make breakfast out of gratitude, but felt obliged to do so. Janice was very angry about all the housework the Magads made her do, believing them to be hypocrites and treating her like a servant rather than a daughter. 
As soon as the news of Janice's confession became known, there was an uproar in the town. All the residents could not believe that a 17-year-old orphan girl had committed such a brutal crime. People began to compare her to the heroine of the movie Orphan, because of which the number of adoptions had already dropped once. As the uproar continued to grow, the investigative team looked into Janice's past and found her mother and two younger brothers. Turns out, Janice wasn't an orphan. When she was very young, her family lived in great poverty. Her father gambled and spent all the family money on gambling. The family was almost constantly starving. In 2013, the girl ran away from home. Standing on that pier, she accepted the help of a concerned woman out of desperation. Having received food, care, and warmth, almost for the first time in her life, she realized that the best solution would be never to remember her parents and brothers again. Her family wasn't looking for her. The lack of an extra mouth only made their lives easier, and there was no money for searching. Perhaps her mother secretly hoped that her daughter was in better circumstances. Since then, Janice realized that pretending to be an orphan is profitable, so you can get sympathy, food, and clothes instead of hunger and beatings, and she can hardly be blamed for that conclusion. Since discovering the truth about the difficult childhood, the motive has become clearer. No one could have imagined the extent to which a traumatized and possibly mentally unstable child would be adopted by the Magad family. In telling Gwen about her difficult life and the imminent lack of payments and housing, Janice had absolutely counted on an invitation to stay at her friend's house. She was used to playing on sympathy, was ready to pay for cleaning and looking after Lewis, but the girl hardly expected that the Magad family would go so far as to adopt. It opened up numerous childhood traumas. All her time in the Magad family had been spent observing the normal lives of other children, longing for such a life, feeling her own inferiority, inferiority, abandonment, and carefully constructed psychological defense mechanisms. She was used to surviving and knew well how to do it. And suddenly, she had it all. Everything she'd ever dreamed of. Having never seen enough care and love from her relatives, she didn't know how to accept such care and didn't understand how one could feel well-being. In her new family, it became difficult for her to accept kindness as something natural. She was constantly looking for a catch. She experienced the usual fear for the future but did not find it reflected in reality. The care and love her adopted daughter received was filtered through her own experiences and emotional wounds. Instead of reassurance, Janice felt tension. She didn't know how to be a daughter, but she knew how to be a hired worker. With the allotted amount of tasks, she explained to herself what was happening. What this house really wanted was a free worker, not a daughter. Everyone was just playing noble and reveling in their charity. Tension began to turn into hatred and a desire for revenge for being treated like a picked-up stray dog. The better the family treated Janice, the more resentment grew in her heart, in her heart of hearts. She felt like a stranger and was jealous of Lavelle and Gwen. The more love Lavella showed her daughters, the more jealousy Janice felt. Unable to deal with such emotions, love and care turned into a source of fear and hatred. She experienced rage and frustration, feeling even more inferior and misunderstood. This distorted perception became a breeding ground for a desire for revenge against those who she felt had simply taken advantage of her trust. Numerous studies of child psychology emphasize the importance of psychological support for children who have experienced difficult periods and emotional trauma, especially in the adoption process. But unfortunately, no one guessed about Janice's past and the emotional traumas she had experienced. The desire to help the orphaned girl turned into a nightmare for the Magood family, ruthless and irreparable. Gwen and Luis were buried in a private cemetery on December 20th, 2021. More than 1,000 people attended the funeral and all expressed their grief. Janice and Merlin were tried separately, but the young men received identical sentences, 32 years in prison without the possibility of parole. When they get out of prison, they will be in their 50s and still have a whole life ahead of them that Gwen, Luis, Cruz, and Lavelle will now not have. A horrific crime has shattered the Magad family forever. Their act of kindness has been rewarded in the most horrific way imaginable. After surviving the horror, it's very difficult to remain kind and strong, but Cruz and Lavella succeeded.
In August 2022, the couple opened a restaurant in honor of their fallen children that serves their favorite dishes. The couple are undergoing psychotherapy and plan to use their business to keep the memory of Gwen and Luis alive. The Amato Family Case when obsession turns a quiet individual into a monster. Like many serious addictions, which can be likened to severe illnesses with psychological, biological, or social underpinnings, this case involves a destructive habit. Whether it's an urge for alcohol, prohibited substances, or gambling, or an obsessive need for a particular activity or interaction with a certain person or group, it's tragic when addiction affects not just the individual, but also their loved ones who strive earnestly to help. The once prosperous and happy Amado family faced such a dilemma head on. As all family members were healthcare professionals, they believed they could handle the situation without external help. By the time they realized the severity of the situation, it was regrettably too late. This isn't a story of mere addiction, but of a young man's extreme obsession with a woman he had never personally met. Compounded by his addiction to forbidden substances, and a pathological inclination towards theft, the situation spiraled into a horrifying outcome. Let's delve into this case to understand if there was a chance to alter the course of events and prevent the tragedy. The Family Home Bloodshed On January 25, 2019, a concerned man contacted the Seminole County Police in Florida. He reported that his close friend and colleague, Cody Amato, a nurse, unexpectedly didn't show up for his shift at the hospital, which was highly unusual for him. The day before, Cody had left work about 15 minutes early due to some urgent family issues at home, departing so hastily he even forgot to collect his pay for the day. Attempts to reach the 31-year-old Cody by phone were unsuccessful. He simply wasn't answering. His girlfriend, with whom he had been living recently, stated that Cody went to his parents' house the previous day at his father's request, but never returned to her place, and she too couldn't reach him. All these signs triggered alarming thoughts, prompting the dispatch of police officers to the provided address. The Amato family home, located in a suburb of Orlando, boasted a large adjoining area, with a stable and a horse walking area. Cody's car was parked in the driveway, and lights were on in several rooms of the house. At first glance, everything seemed normal, no signs of forced entry or struggle, with the doors and windows intact. When the sheriff's deputy knocked, there was no response, and calls to the landline also went unanswered. The police then sought permission to enter, and upon approval, cautiously unlocked the back door using a knife to slide the bolt. Inside, an eerie silence pervaded, though the lit room suggested someone must be present. Indeed, the homeowners were there, the officers first discovered the lifeless body of 59-year-old family patriarch, Chad Amato, lying on the kitchen floor in a pool of his own blood, with two close-range gunshot wounds to his chest. Next, at the staircase opposite the main entrance, lay Cody, curled up and also deceased in a massive pool of blood. Lastly, they found 61-year-old Margaret Amato sitting at her computer in the home office. At first glance, she seemed to be napping with her head resting on her arm, if not for the blood splatters on the monitor and a large, spreading stain beneath her head. The murder weapon, an IUI Jericho 941 pistol found next to Cody's body, was later determined by forensic experts to have his fingerprints. With no signs of break-in or external presence and nothing missing from the house, it initially appeared that Cody, possibly after a family dispute, had ended their lives and then shot himself in the chest. However, smeared blood on the front door indicated it was locked by someone leaving the house after the incident, suggesting the perpetrator wasn't among the deceased family members. Regarding the likely suspect, there were little doubts. Those familiar or connected with the Amato family pointed to their youngest son, 30-year-old Grant, who had been missing since that evening. His car, a white Honda, along with some personal items including a laptop from Grant's room, were gone implying that the owner had taken them. Grant was declared a person of interest, and a search was initiated for his whereabouts. What's known about the Amado family? Margaret Ann Amado, 
Nay Wade, and Chad Robert Amato tied the knot in the mid-1980s. Margaret, two years senior to Chad, was already raising a three-year-old son, Jason, from a previous marriage. Chad wasn't deterred by her having a child. Instead, he was ready to raise Jason as his own. In 1988, the couple welcomed their first child together, a son named Cody, followed by the birth of their youngest son, Grant Tiernan Amato, on May 20th, 1989. From childhood, the brothers shared a close bond. Raised in a well-off family, they hardly ever faced denials. However, to earn certain privileges, they had to adhere to family rules, excel in school, help with household chores, and exhibit good behavior. They strived to be the pride and support of their parents. Both parents held advanced degrees in healthcare. Margaret was a senior operational manager in a prestigious private clinic, while Chad, initially a clinical pharmacist, later shifted to software specialization. The family was quite affluent, living in a spacious suburban home with their own stable, breeding thoroughbred racehorses as a hobby. After finishing high school at 18, Jason left home, pursued university education, and started his own life. He got married, settled a family, and moved to another state, maintaining a close relationship with his parents and younger brothers. Cody and Grant were almost inseparable, attending the same school, joining the same sports team, and regularly visiting the shooting range with their father on weekends. The Amatos had an impressive firearm collection, including rare pieces, accessible only to the family patriarch for safety reasons. The youngest son, Grant, was the youngest of three sons in the family, and as often happens, he received the lion's share of everyone's attention and adoration. As a child, he was frail and sickly, so everyone tried to surround him with love and care. He grew up to be a modest and very shy boy, finding it hard to connect with peers, making his brothers his only friends. Grant became particularly close to Cody after their eldest brother, Jason, grew up and left home. After high school, the brothers pursued medical degrees together, eventually becoming anesthesiologists. While Cody excelled in his studies, becoming the top student in his class, Grant barely made it through with low grades. Nevertheless, both managed to land jobs in their field at a hospital. Cody earned a reputation as a reliable professional, but Grant frequently got into trouble, making errors and needing his work double-checked. In the summer of 2018, Grant's career at the hospital ended scandalously. He was caught stealing strictly controlled sedatives, which caused euphoria and hallucinations, and were used rarely for anesthesia. The discovery led to police involvement, and Grant was arrested. During interrogation, he admitted to the theft, claiming he administered the drugs to patients who, in his opinion, were under-medicated. Many believed Grant was using or selling the drugs illegally, though there was no direct evidence. He was immediately suspended and later fired. His criminal case for theft was eventually dismissed, reportedly due to his parents' intervention. Unemployed and Internet Dependent after losing his job, the 29-year-old man, already a loner, became even more withdrawn. He spent weeks indoors, glued to his computer, mostly browsing adult websites. Grant never had a girlfriend and struggled with social interactions with women, leaving him feeling inadequate. He indulged in viewing adult content and frequently interacted with webcam models on specialized platforms, trying to fill the void of a non-existent personal life. This private interaction, of course, came at a cost. Grant easily accessed funds from his parents and older brother's accounts for these activities. This obsession quickly spiraled into an addiction, compounded by regular alcohol consumption. But Grant seemed content with this lifestyle, living off his family, spending their money without contributing anything in return. Eventually, his father issued an ultimatum, find a job soon, or he'd have to leave home and lose any financial support from the family. Grant promised his father to resolve the issue but had no real intention of seeking employment. He claimed he would become a streamer, earning by broadcasting video games. His parents, seeing this as better than nothing, agreed to set up a streaming station for him. Once everything was in place, Grant pretended to be streaming, asking for privacy. But in reality, he was locked in his room, indulging in his favorite pastime, visiting adult-only websites. Trip to Japan In August 2018, 
when Cody took a vacation from work, he decided to embark on a journey across the globe for a change of scenery. Dreaming of visiting Japan, he invited his younger brother Grant and his best friend Jeremy. While Cody and Jeremy had their own funds for the trip, earned independently, Grant's vacation was financed by their parents. However, rather than giving the money directly to Grant, they entrusted it to Cody, the more responsible of the two. The trip lasted nearly two weeks, and throughout it, Grant seemed disengaged. He showed little interest in tours or landmarks, constantly fixated on his smartphone's screen. He often stayed back at the hotel, using his brother's laptop. On a day the group went to Lake Kawaguchi near Mount Fuji, Jeremy accidentally left his credit card in their hotel room. Seizing the opportunity, Grant hacked into Jeremy's account and withdrew thousands of dollars, spending it all on private sessions with his favorite webcam model. Jeremy discovered the theft later, but initially suspected fraud. He couldn't pinpoint the culprit and continued to investigate the incident after returning home, unaware that Grant was responsible. Sylvia Venceslavova, Sylvie. Now let's delve into the most intriguing part, the identity of the mysterious webcam model who became an obsession for Grant. On a site where Grant paid for private online interactions with various women, he met the stunning Sylvia Venceslavova from Bulgaria, known as Sylvie. She captivated him with her striking looks, confidence, charisma, and passion. Sylvie made Grant feel special, loved, desired, and unique. He began to believe that her feelings for him were genuine, and they could have a real relationship. Grant was convinced they were in a relationship, and he needed to win over this fiery brunette from all her other admirers. He spent hours and thousands of dollars daily to ensure she had no time for other men. Grant also showered her with gifts like expensive lingerie and jewelry, which she would wear during their video chats. Desperate to impress Sylvie, Grant constantly fabricated stories, losing touch with reality. He claimed to live alone in a large house, own a successful business, and could afford to lavish her with money. He backed up his claims with money transfers, initially sending a couple of thousand dollars, then ten thousand and even a hundred thousand dollars as a birthday gift. Naturally, Grant's lavish spending didn't go unnoticed by his parents, as he was using their accounts. At first, he explained it as investments in his own online project to attract an audience, but Chad and Margaret quickly realized their son was lying. Scandal, escape, and rehab clinic. A serious family dispute erupted at home. The patriarch demanded that the youngest son immediately pack his things and leave, but his mother and Cody intervened on Grant's behalf. The family understood that Grant was suffering from severe internet addiction. However, they were baffled about how he had spent nearly $200,000 from their accounts. A thorough search in his room uncovered vials of potent substances. Grant explained he used them to keep from going insane. The parents announced they would cut off his access to their accounts and intended to send him for mandatory treatment for drug and internet addiction. In response, Grant declared he was tired of everything and ready to end his life. He then dashed out of the house, jumped into his car, and sped away at high speed in an unknown direction. Later, it was discovered that Grant went to his aunt and uncle's house, crashed through their fence, and hit the garage wall. Aware of the turmoil in the Amato family, his relatives sympathized with him and offered him a place to stay until things settled. He readily agreed, but robbed his kind-hearted relatives the next day, stealing thousands of dollars from their accounts to pay for interactions with Sylvie. When Grant's aunt informed his parents, they asked her not to call the police, promising to resolve the situation and return the stolen money. That same day, Chad personally went to their house and took Grant, who urgently needed intervention. Chad, Margaret, and Cody realized that reasoning with him was futile, and if he left home, he would likely commit theft again. They then presented Grant with a different ultimatum. Either he would go to a rehabilitation clinic for treatment of his addictions or face jail time for theft. Reluctantly, Grant agreed to enter the clinic, where he would spend two months away from any temptations. He was admitted to the medical institution at the end of December 2018. The Grown Man's Little Secret While Grant was in treatment, his parents checked his computer and discovered where their son was spending thousands of dollars daily from their family accounts. They found the profile of Sylvie, 
the woman who had deeply affected their son, reviewed their correspondence and found hundreds of recordings of their intimate private online interactions that Grant treasured and often revisited. The Amatos decided to inform Sylvie that her admirer, who had showered her with money and gifts, was not a businessman, but an ordinary unemployed man with drug and internet addictions. They also pointed out that the funds Grant transferred to her were stolen, potentially subjecting him to criminal charges. However, Sylvie remained indifferent, as for her, it was just a job, and she had no intention of returning the money. The Unexpected Return On January 5, 2019, just a couple of weeks into his treatment, Grant made an abrupt return home, having completed less than a quarter of the necessary rehabilitation program. He had fled the clinic, where he was noted for his complete lack of compliance. Grant tearfully vowed to turn his life around and find employment, but threatened to end his life if forced to return to the rehab center. His parents agreed, but laid down strict rules. Grant was barred from using the computer, had to follow a strict schedule, and all his earnings were closely monitored. Additionally, he was given a part-time job at a local grocery warehouse. For about three weeks, Grant seemed to comply, leading his parents to believe he had matured and left his addictions behind. However, everything changed on Thursday, January 24, 2019, when Grant persuaded his mother to let him use the laptop briefly to check his email and post his resume online, hoping to find a more ambitious job than his current warehouse position. Margaret trusted her son and allowed him to use the laptop, making a fatal mistake. Naturally, Grant first tried to contact Sylvie, only to discover that his parents had already written to her, exposing the truth about him. He saw this as a betrayal. Moreover, his parents had humiliated him in front of the only woman he loved, and they had to pay for that. The Brutal Takedown of Family Remember the previously mentioned home gun collection? Chad had kept it in a special large safe, the key to which he trusted no one. However, Grant knew about another gun stored in his parents' bedroom, always kept loaded by his father, and it was this gun he decided to use. His mother was sitting at the computer in the home office when her youngest son quietly approached her from behind and shot her in the back of the head. The position of her body suggested she didn't even have time to turn around or understand what was happening. Next was his father, who was about to return home from work. As soon as Chad entered the kitchen, he was confronted face to face with Grant and immediately received two bullets to the chest. Grant tensely contemplated his next move, devising an even more monstrous plan. He decided to frame his own brother Cody, the only person who had always stood up for him, helped him, and been his best friend. By then, Cody had moved out of the family home and was living separately with his girlfriend. To lure Cody home, Grant used his now-deceased father's phone to send several messages asking him to come home immediately because something terrible had happened. He didn't elaborate, confident that this information would be enough to make his brother rush home from work. Grant's calculation was correct, and Cody indeed arrived, even leaving work early. Entering the house, he only made it to the bottom of the staircase leading to the second floor before being shot and collapsing. Cody didn't die instantly. He had time to realize the horror of the situation, but was powerless to change it. After eliminating his family, Grant coldly wiped his fingerprints off the pistol, placed the weapon in his brother's hand to leave his prints, and then left it next to the body, making it look as if Cody had shot their parents and then himself. The rest of the evening, the killer calmly packed his things, downloaded video files of his communications with Sylvie from the computer, and even texted the girl. Having finished his affairs, he loaded his essentials into the car and drove away. Arrest and Trial It took the police just over a day to track down and arrest Grant, who was hiding in a small roadside motel in Orange County. He wasn't surprised, more disappointed that he was found so quickly, but he vehemently denied any guilt. During his interrogation at the station, he spun unbelievable tales about his father's incredible cruelty, alleging mistreatment towards him, his mother, and brother. Grant also spoke of his father's attempts to separate him from his beloved girlfriend Sylvie, whom he claimed to share true and pure love with. Regarding the events at their family home on the evening of January 24, 2019, 
his account was confusing and inconsistent. He suggested that his father and brother had a fight. Cody grabbed a gun and ended Chad's life, with Margaret being an accidental victim. Grant claimed he could only guess the chronology of these horrific events, as he wasn't a witness himself, stating he spent the night in his car with his belongings after his father kicked him out. In the morning, he said he simply drove away, unaware of the tragedy that had unfolded at home. His story sounded disjointed and implausible, and the evidence indirectly pointed to him as the sole perpetrator. As a result, Grant was arrested as the primary suspect in the triple homicide of his family members. He was held on a $750,000 bond, which he was unable to post, and thus remained in custody awaiting trial. The trial commenced on July 15, 2019. Notably, almost all witnesses who testified in court spoke against Grant, including his older brother Jason, relatives, and Cody's friend Jeremy, whom Grant had stolen money from during their trip to Japan. Those who knew the defendant personally described him as prone to various addictions, a pathological thief, and a liar. The main piece of evidence against Grant was a significant bank transfer from Chad's account to his younger son's. This transaction occurred late at night when all family members were already deceased. To confirm the transaction, the defendant had used his deceased father's finger for identification. The prosecution pushed for the death penalty, while his defense argued that Grant was ill and needed treatment. The final verdict was delivered on August 12, 2019. The court found 30-year-old Grant Amato guilty of first-degree triple homicide and sentenced him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and also don't forget to click the bell. There are many shocking stories ahead.